Herzliche Grüße von unserem Rektor, der hat sich entschuldigt, weil er musste dringend nach Polen fahren, aber er hat mich sozusagen erlaubt, Ihnen zu begrüßen, betreuen und alles Gute wünschen. Ja, prägitam se na sam pre i predao vitanja vid našo rektora, oca Vodana Praha, jaki, na žalj, s považnih pročenim si ubili kateri do Polši, ali vim prosil vitate našo šanovnoho hostja. Predsina vodja tako što ću podjakovati Austrijskom biro kooperaciji, panovi Andreja Sloveningeru za te, što vim do nas zavde, prevodeć top osid, jaki nam duže prijemno zavde tu hostelje. Ja maju osobljivu, osobistu čest i prijemnost privitate vicekanclera Erharda Buseka, tomu što me z njim znajomi davno. Točniše skazati, što me z njim znajomi, to ne zovsim tak. Poznajomili se me ne znajuče odin odnoho i pamjet pro ce je zberihaju do sihodnišnjeho dnja. Vešlo duži cikav, tomu što v 93. roci, koli dr. Erhard Busek bil vicekanclerom in ministrom nauke ta dosličen, Він організував, він забезпечив величезну програму обміну, завдяки якій я вперше в житті потрапив на Захід і саме до Відня. Звісно, що доктор Гусик не знав, що я приїду до Відня, але по дорозі до Відня трапилася одна історія, яка має відношення до нашої сьогоднішньої теми, і я її хочу розказати. Я трошки вкраду часу, але вона вартує того. Ще раз нагадую, це є 93-й рік, я вперше їду за кордон з радянським паспортом, ще в якому було 4 сторінки, тому що совєтський чоловік більше не міг їздити. І в цьому паспорті стояв штамп, що я вже громадянин Незалежної України. І перший чистокровний австрієць, якого я зустрів, був, звичайно, пограничник, прикордонник. І він мене дуже увічливо запитав, «Во фарнзі, гін, куди ви їдете?» Я сказав, я їду до Відня, оцюди. Для чого? Я кажу, я історик, я їду до Відня, буду досліджувати нашу спільну історію, тому що я займаюся історією. Він тоді питається, звідки, звідки ви є? Бо Гельзинці? Я кажу, я з України. Бачу, він дивиться на мій паспорт, йому це нічого не говорить. Я продовжую думати, як знайти коннекшн. Тоді я кажу, я з Галичини. Я з Галичини. І їду до Відня, нашої столиці, щоб досліджувати нашу спільну історію. Він знову дивиться на паспорт, листає, совєцький, листає, його дивиться на мене і тоді каже знамениту фразу, я її скажу по-німецьки і тоді по-українськи. Він каже, «Дан герфлєрен зі мір біте варум зі мі цовєтішен пас, а ус іспаніян убер слова «Халя пустарай фар». Він мене питає, то сто, поясніть мені, чому ви совєтським паспортом з Іспанії Галісія там є. Він знав, напевно, відпочивав там. Галісія для нього нічого не означала. Чому ви не їдете з Іспанії чи не Словаччину до Відня? Тоді я зрозумів, що наша спільна історія не для всіх знайома. Тоді я зрозумів, що для багатьох австрійців Україна не є Європою. Але я дуже дякую доктору Бусику, що завдяки його стипендіям я мав нагоду відвідати Відень. І не тільки я, а багато молодих людей скористались цієї нагоди. І зараз ці люди займають топ-позиції в літературі, в науці і так далі. Згадаю лише Ярослава Грицака, Василя Росевича, Тимофія Гаврилєва і ще кілька інших, які цю першу хвилю поїхали до Австрії, відчули спільність з Австрією. І ми це пам'ятаємо, і вам дуже за це дякуємо. А сьогодні ви нам розкажете, що нас чекає в майбутньому. І Європа. Дякую вам дуже за запрошення зустрічати вас. Дякую вам дуже за запрошення. 
I think I was in the Austrian government, and in this time, still Soviet Union was existing. Uh, we were considering we shall build, build up a consulate, consulate general. And the discussion in the Austrian government was uh, to do it in, in this time, Leningrad uh, or in Kiev. Uh, I think I was uh, from the one party saying it should be in Kiev. I succeeded on this subject and we opened the consulate general in Kiev. And uh, being vice chancellor there in this time, before Ukraine uh, was leaving the Soviet Union or before the end of the Soviet Union, it was quite close, uh, I did a visit uh, here. And uh, official meeting, I was vice chancellor, so I had to meet the deputy prime minister and so on and so on. Uh, and you have to understand I'm neither speaking Ukrainian nor Russian. No idea. But at a certain moment, this uh, deputy prime minister said to me, now we are official. You are vice chancellor, I'm vice prime minister uh, of Ukraine, he said already. Now I have not to speak Russian, I have to speak Ukrainian with you. <laughs> For me, no difference, <laughs> because I was neither understanding the one <laughs> or the other. I think it was a kind of a symbol of the change of the map uh, and the situation existing here, and I was quite happy that I pushed through this consulate general because it was the first embassy uh, as uh, Ukraine became independent. The first embassy, and we were the first uh, acknowledging uh, the uh, right to recognize uh, Ukraine as an independent state. Uh, that's a long time ago. Things have moved and uh, I will jump to, to the real theme uh, where I'm here. I spoke at the Catholic University but not here. I think it was in, in the center uh, some time ago. It was before the summit uh, in Vilnius. And I remember the everyday discussions the students were asking, uh, what about this treaty with the European Union? Uh, will it be done? And so what we are thinking, uh, I think uh, we, all, we were all full of hopes, uh, but uh, things went different, we have to say. Uh, and that's a real difficult situation. Things went different, uh, dear friends, I have to say, we are in midst a tremendous change of the situation of Europe, but not only of Europe. Uh, and before I'm telling you nice stories, what we are intending to do and how close the relations are, I, think I will tell you, seeing from my side, the truth. The truth that we are concerning Europe and maybe the global development on a crucial uh, point. Again, a personal story. I'm born through the time of the Second World War. I grew up, get my feelings from my homeland uh, after the end of the Second World War. Uh, in this time, the four allies uh, were occupying Austria uh, for 10 years. And in 1955, uh, we gained uh, independence. Uh, independence uh, by a so-called state treaty, uh, giving us back the sovereignty. Uh, this was very impressive because you have to know the background of this sovereignty had a difficult story. The one was 100 years ago, the beginning of the First World War, the falling into pieces of the Habsburg monarchy or Danube monarchy or Austria-Hungary, whatever you want to say. Uh, I think it was a huge difference uh, for my grandparents but also for my parents because uh, they grew up partly uh, in this time of a bigger state. Uh, my whole family is uh, in the construction business and architects. And uh, even my father, uh, as he started uh, to work on this field, it was after the end of the Danube monarchy, uh, but he was for sure traveling around and doing a lot of work uh, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary, uh, in this time Yugoslavia, or to be precise, the Kingdom of Serbia, Croatia, and Slovenia. This was the official name uh, of uh, this state, which fell into pieces in our time. Uh, they had another perspective uh, of a bigger space. We grew up, and I grew up, uh, in the limits of small Austria, and the limits were the Iron Curtain. 
so far I think my knowledge of Europe was limited. One side and the Austrians of my generation have the feeling, oh, we are on the eastern rim of the Western world. Uh, let's be careful. Uh, I think uh, no difficulties with the Soviets, otherwise they might come back again and so on and so on. I think that played a very important role uh, growing up. And so I may tell you the better side, and this was the advantage of my lifetime. First of all, every year the situation was better better, better, step by step. We earned a little bit more, we had better jobs, we were able to travel around. I will never forget, uh, it's crazy if you are telling it the young generation in Austria. Uh, I will never forget, my parents told me, ah, now we have a little bit more money, we shall go to the former places we know out of the past. Uh, the first uh, travel we did in 1952, I remember this outside was to South Tyrol, which was a part of Austria, part of Italy. I think it's a kind of commemoration it was. Uh, and to Venice, to go to Venice. Uh, okay? And in the next year we went to, to Apatia, as they said, Opatia. Uh, it is now a part of Croatia. It is Peninsula Istria, I think, if you have an imagination uh, of the map, and Trieste. Uh, Trieste or Trust or Trieste, different languages. Trieste Italian, Trust uh, is Serbian, Slovenian, Slovenian or Croatian or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, Trieste, uh, it is in the German language. Uh, I think at this time, I think no, maybe nobody knows it. It, it was uh, uh, not a part of a state, it was ad administered one part. Uh, by the American British and the other part by the Yugoslavs. It was a divided area in this time. Later on they made an arrangement and the one part came uh, here to Italy and the other part came uh, to uh, Yugoslavia uh, in this time. I think this was the world in which I grew up. And so you might understand, uh, I understood really the European integration as a peace project. I think this was really extremely important and I think it was a success story until now, until now. The first difficulties we had uh, as Yugoslavia fell into pieces, uh, here I may say that's one of the uh, impressive uh, impacts of European integration uh, that the downfall of the Soviet Empire gave the perspective to the countries coming out of the Soviet Empire, like the Baltic states, uh, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia at this time, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and so on, to have the perspective of the European Union. Uh, I think, allow me to be very critical of the Western European countries, the conviction that they are Europe in Prague, Warsaw, Budapest, and so on and so on, was there. The conviction that these countries are Europe was not so much in Paris, <laughs> Madrid, London, and so on and so on. But there was no alternative. I will never forget, uh, I was befriended with Václav Havel, uh, later on president of Czechoslovakia, or Czech Republic. I think he started uh, with the sentence, uh, we will back to Europe. I met my friend Václav Havel and said, are you crazy? You are in Europe. Why do you want to be back to Europe? And he explained me quite clear that uh, being a part of the Soviet Empire, we are out of Europe uh, with this. It is strange because you have to know Prague, look to the yeah. map, is more Western than Vienna. Eh? So far, <laughs> what shall we do? We have uh, sometimes crazy expressions. Eastern enlargement. I was always fighting this expression. It was the enlargement of 2004, 2007. It was not an Eastern enlargement. It was an enlargement in Central Europe, in the center uh, of Europe. I think this is the difficult expression and maybe psychologically, uh, I think it is of great importance. Uh, in Europe, sometimes Eastern means uh, Eastern. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that's a question to yourself. Eastern Ukraine, also people, uh, <laughs> at the rim, huh? 
so far, we Austrians had for a very long time the feeling being in the eastern rim of the Western free world. Uh, and uh, this development of the downfall of the Iron Curtain, of the enlargement of the European Union, was a tremendous improvement for my country, for my generation. Uh, I was in the government as we entered the European Union, uh, and for sure it was a tremendous success story uh, for Austria. If you are looking to the economic figures, uh, really great. If you are looking to the situation, uh, relations to the neighbor, neighbors, really great. They were out of the past, out of history, a lot of tensions. Now I think, with some differences for sure, there are always differences, uh, we are living really in a good situation. So I have to confess to you, and please uh, believe me, I was really convinced now Europe is in the best shape and it is developing and we have to do step by step enlargement in Southeast Europe. We did it uh, in the Thessaloniki summit in 2003 for all these countries. I was one of the actors of this conference uh, and there was a clear perspective uh, here for sure for Europe. Now the bad message. I think by this, what has happened concerning Crimea and what's happened in the eastern part of Ukraine and by a general development, obviously, either we are on an end of this development and we are coming in another situation or it is interrupted. If it is interrupted, okay, it would be really great. Personally, it's better to be quite clear to you. I'm extremely pessimistic. Uh, why? So I'm making a jump out of Europe. If you are looking now, my proposal is to the globe. I'm inviting you, take some needles and read the newspapers and the reports where we have now clashes, wars, difficulties, and, so on, and put a needle in. I think uh, you would have a horrible imp impression of the globe. Huh? Everywhere needles. That is the real uh, situation. I don't know the English word for eagle. What is eagle in English? That's this nice animal uh, which has a lot of... Stacheln. Uh -huh. yes. yes, yeah. I think uh, the globe is looking in this way and I think the situation is so. Uh, wherever it's going, I think uh, peace is hurted. It's not existing. We have clashes and so on and so on. And the other thing which I have to add, what is really shocking me, because I am a fan of dialogue, understanding, international organizations, and at the end, I think you can forget nearly all the international organizations. I think your country, Ukraine, and Russia are members of the Council of Europe. <coughs> Did you hear anything from the Council of Europe concerning the situation here? Zero. Nothing. OECE is a little bit appearing thanks to uh, a Swiss representative. He's an eager guy, he's doing a good job. But uh, I think in reality, besides the fact that they have 250 uh, advisors running around here in Ukraine or Russia or wherever they are, uh, but the results are really zero. United Nations, it was uh, invented, I think, uh, to gain more peace. I think. Nothing is here. I met recently the ambassador of the European Union to the United Nations, an old friend of mine, and said to him, well, what we are doing in the United Nations? I cannot hear anything about the United Nations concerning all these crises. Yeah? And he said to me, defending the institution, but we are great in humanities. And here I told him the United Nations is existing to avoid that humanities are necessary. Yeah? You have to fight for peace and not to establish humanities I think to, to, to lower down the difficulties and so on and so on. I think that's a tremendous change in which we are living. It is better to face this. I think I'm not intending to be pessimistic, but I'm sometimes quite close. And that's a job also for politics and I was for a very long time a politician to be realistic. I think to have always to prepare uh, the worst situation. If the best situation is coming, not the worst situation, happiness. I think things are really great, uh, but in this time, for sure, we are living. I add something which is quite necessary for the discussion of, discussion of Europeans. I think sometimes we have to be aware, what is Europe now? 
Don't forget, we are only 7%, hold your 7% of the global population. 7%. Not too much. As I started considering politics, I think it was quite a little bit different. We are still between 18 and 20% of the economic power. The others are coming up. India, China, Brazil, uh, and so on and so on. Also by this, uh, the influence of the Europeans altogether, I think, uh, is for sure uh, shrinking. And in this situation, I think we have to do our job. And uh, here to return to your situation, which I may say quite straight, is not only your situation, it's a European situation. Uh, but I have to say, it has to be understood by all the Europeans. Uh, I learned uh, quite a lot uh, on this by running around, campaigning for enlargement and so on and so on, even as Austria entered uh, the European Union. As a member of the government, and I was uh, Deputy Prime Minister of this government, I had to campaign in different countries that they are agreeing that we are part of the European Union. Personally, I have to confess, first of all, I was convinced everybody knows Austria. Why? Because we have Mozart and Beethoven, uh, we have the Young Boys Choir, and the, in skiing we are important, uh, and it's a beautiful country, and so on and so on. And as I went to parts of Spain and Portugal, they had not the slightest idea about Austria. Yeah? I had to explain where it is. Yeah? Maybe it happens to you uh, because, uh, as it was told, Galicia, <laughs> as a province of Spain, <laughs> can also be mixed up. Uh, I think uh, this you have to consider. Uh, I think it is quite necessary concerning the horrible situation you have in the eastern part and also concerning establishing peace, uh, lasting peace, uh, here in this part of Europe and in general in Europe. I think we have to do something that you are pretty well known, that you are more known as today. Again, an example, and I have to apologize that they're always using examples, maybe primitive examples, but you are learning sometimes out of primitive examples and things that happens to you more than you're doing it theoretical. I think some months ago, I was speaking in the most western city of Austria. It is Bregenz, it's not necessary to know it, uh, it is at Lake Constance, uh, where the River Rhine is going through, uh, speaking about Europe. I opened uh, my comment, and it was still in the beginning of the difficulties here. I was saying that, dear friends here in Bregenz, uh, I'm coming from Vienna, but you have to know that's a longer distance as from Vienna to Uskorod. Everybody was silent. This was a real shock. Then somebody was crying, where is Ushkorod? Hmm? <laughs> the Kapatu Ukraine, closer to Vienna than Bregenz. Then somebody stood up and it was very nice. I said, I don't believe it. I'm going home and I'm <laughs> looking here at the globe if it is really true. Hmm? He never returned because it's really true. Hmm? Uh, I think we are still missing, and that's one of the consequences of the Iron Curtain, uh, a mutual good knowledge of, about each other, who is living where, uh, what are the distances, what is the mixture, what is the historical background uh, here, what are the reasons for different situations. Huh? I think uh, I met a lot of people who were really shocked uh, as I was telling the Russians in Donbass. Huh? Then I was telling, okay, Stalin uh, was doing the killing of the Kulaks uh, also there. And he put Russians there in. Uh, what about Kulaks? Stalin is still known a little bit. Uh, because I think we had a lot of photos also in Austria about Stalin 10 years uh, everywhere on public buildings. Uh, but uh, I think there's a lack of knowledge uh, going in this direction. And I think it's quite necessary. So far, it's one of the difficulties, and I was in charge of the stability back for Southeast Europe, and uh, in this instrument of the European Union, uh, Moldova was a part. 
the real problem of Moldova is that we are not really able to cooperate in all the questions of Transnistria. I think not necessary to tell it to you because you are aware about Transnistria. I think a lot of Europeans have had to explain what is Transnistria. It was really not a part of Moldova, but Stalin being a Georgian, uh, but in fact being a real Russian nationalist, put everywhere as he was uh, drawing the borders of the different Soviet republics, a lot of Russians in. I think obviously to balance uh, here the situation. Uh, I think this he did and where no Russians have been, uh, like in Latvia and Estonia, he put it there by migration. Industrial migration, industrialization, uh, and so on and so on. I think if you are telling this story, may I tell you a little bit westwards from here, everybody will tell you. Huh? I grew up in the feeling that it was really a joke also by cabaretists uh, saying, uh, who is living in Russia? They are all Russians. If you are looking, uh, they are not all Russians. Huh? In this time of the Soviet Empire, there were Uzbeks, Kyrgyz, and so on and so on, and nowadays there are Bashkirs and Buyets uh, and so on and so on. It's a tremendous variety. But I grew up with a map uh, on the wall uh, where there was a great red spot that was the Soviet Union. And so far, everybody was leaving all the Russians there. Huh? I think we have to learn, sometimes to relearn even Europe to relearn even Europe about differentiation. Uh, that's for sure quite necessary. And that's the current situation. I think you would uh, say what are the real perspectives. Uh, and I was asked also here by journalists about the enlargement of the European Union. I want to be quite outspoken. I think I appreciate very much Jean-Claude Juncker, the new president of the European Commission. I know him for a very long time. I was not happy about his statement and declaration, but it is very realistic. He said no enlargement of the European Union within the next five years. I think the European Union did the mistake to promise too many enlargements and they were not able to realize. So you are creating wrong hopes. Even I want to be outspoken, if I would have the power, uh, I would say no enlargement with Turkey because that's too much for the European Union. I think you have to look to the maps. We are getting neighborhood uh, with the Caucasus states. We are getting neighborhood with Iraq, Iran, Syria, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, Lebanon, it is too much for the European Union. Why? Because the European Union is not yet an actor like a nation state. There's maybe one chance, and hopefully the governments are getting the whole thing. The nation state is losing importance. And I spoke about all these crises. You, you remember the needles in the globe. Huh? It is not anymore a war between states. We have the 100-year jubilee of the First World War. We have 75 years uh, of the beginning of the Second World War, uh, Germany, Poland, uh, and so on and so on. Here, I think the impression of a war was borders, armies going here, fighting and so on and so on. We have now fightings and may some kind of borders internally. Where is the border in this fight uh, with ISIS or, or, or IS, is Islamic State in Lebanon and Syria? There are no borders. It is a movement out uh, of the population or an infiltration from outside. Is it a fight about borders in eastern Ukraine? No, it's infiltration, uh, which I think they're giving the impression that they are coming from inside, wherever they are coming. I think I read in the newspapers, uh, Ukraine will build a wall. Uh, may I say it's a pure nonsense, because uh, concerning walls, you can always go around. The biggest wall project in history uh, was the wall uh, in the north of China. It played never a role in protection of China. I think <laughs> there was no war hindered uh, by this. I think we have borders where we have inf infiltration politically by the society, uh, by the mines uh, and so on and so on. 
And I think this is a real battle in which we are. Uh, I think it's not my job to give Ukraine advice what she, she shall do, but allow me, I think, to make some hints in which direction. I think Ukraine will be stronger if you are improving internally for yourself. Improving by democracy, improving by administration, improving by jurisdiction, improving in fighting corruption, uh, improving in education, extremely important. I told you I was in charge of the stability back for Southeast Europe uh, in the Balkans. I was not allowed by the European Union to do some education. Why? Because education is not a European responsibility. It is still up to the nation state. My friends, it's nonsense. For sure it is a job of the nation state, but it is also a European job. We need a kind of European education, starting with the values, starting with the human rights and so on and so on, but also with all the capacities. What you are doing here, for example, that's for sure European, it's internationally uh, and has a, a great importance. It has to be done uh, here in common. And I think the best step that the Ukraine can do is to improve all this, and for sure here, as a support from outside, is for sure quite necessary. Sometimes I want to be quite open, and I'm uh, criticizing myself as a politician. We are always only considering, okay, if there's enough money, then everything is possible. For sure you need money, without any doubt. Uh, but you need educated persons, you need personal investment, in this sense uh, of uh, uh, intelligence, of power, of, of uh, brain, uh, and so on and so on. That's the real battle which we have to do. Because obviously there are different perceptions. I think Russia under Putin is an autocracy. Uh, it is a kind of dictatorship for sure, uh, without any doubt. Uh, and here okay, it's right, we have to keep the dialogue, we have to negotiate, we have to stay in contact, and so on and so on. Uh, but sometimes I think it's not really possible. I think, how to compromise? Eh? I think Crimea, part of Russia, yes or no, what is a compromise? Mm -hmm. eh? Half and half? Nonsense. Eh? Uh, I think here you have to understand that we're in a very different situation, and I have to confess that uh, we in the European Union, I don't want to say we Europeans, we in the European Union have not yet invented the right strategy. Step by step it's improving. One of the side effects of Vladimir Putin, may I say, might be that the European Union as a whole is becoming stronger by the power of the European institutions. I think that was not intended by Vladimir Putin. But what he is doing is he is pushing us together. The real problem of the European integration is it is not a state. It is not a subject uh, following the international law, but it is not a state. We have no government. The European Commission is an administration body uh, and not a government. We have a parliament, but the parliament is not the rights which parliaments have in a democracy. It is limited. It is improving. For example, that we were voting for the President of the European Commission, I think, is really great. May I say, one mistake, uh, I think, uh, me personally, I voted for somebody who was not a candidate for the European <coughs> Parliament. That's Mr. Juncker, who was not a candidate for the European Parliament. It's a right de decision. Uh, but here you can see in the system, I think it is not yet arrived what means a European democracy. Here we have a lot of uh, lacks, uh, uh, deficits uh, going in this direction, which is uh, quite open here discussed. Uh, so far, I think we are amidst the situation in the European states. On the one side, there's a tendency by parties, we have too much Europe. I think Brussels is too influential, let's lower it down. Uh, these are the so-called uh, neo-nationalists, I may say they are not neo-nationalists, they are old egoists. Right? In the situation of insecurity, and we all have the feeling uh, that uh, the earth is moving and I want to be protected. That's one of the, the general tendencies uh, of a human being. I want to be protected. Yeah? So far we are saying, ah, uh, let's do it. There's a nice saying in Vienna, I love this sentence. 
Everybody uh, is looking to himself or herself. Only me, I'm looking to myself. I think if you are considering this sentence, it's very important. Uh, I think this is a tendency which is for sure in the moment happening in the European states. Uh, but I think we have to learn the lessons that we can do it only uh, in common. This you cannot dictate. That's one of the advantages of the European Union. I think we have to learn it and we are paying a price for learning it, without any doubt. Uh, that's also uh, the discussions. I was uh, asked and uh, contacted here uh, in, in Lviv and I understand this. What about the Austrians? Eh? Uh, the Austrians uh, are getting a visit by Vladimir Putin. They are praised by the President of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, I think this is an old tendency of my beloved country. I think sometimes we have the tendency to muddle through. Huh? I think uh, don't criticize somebody. We are keeping out of everything. Uh, uh, we had a Pope, it was Paul VI, uh, he was saying, uh, uh, I think uh, Austria is the island of the beatified, uh, Insel der Seligen, island of, uh, we are not an island. My country is not an island, we are living in midst Europe, and it plays a certain role. And we have to learn the lesson. I got it today, uh, I think uh, the delivering of gas to Austria was reduced by the Russians by 15%. Uh, it was reduced by 50% for the Polish. Huh? You can see, I think it is like in the classroom. Huh? Teacher Vladimir is saying, eh, did, did the bad lesson? 50%. Eh? But it also some criticism, 15%, and so on and so on. And so we have to learn how to react and how to depend our, on ourselves. Maybe concerning energy, I'm a little bit happy about the shortenings uh, of gas because we have to consider what are the alternatives. And we have to invest more in the alternatives. That's also good. Everything, uh, for every problem, an alternative is existing. And now all those, uh, we have a German expression, Putin Versteher, those who are understanding Vladimir Putin, it's a special group here, they will learn the lesson. I think I saw today, uh, thanks to my friend Andrea Weninger, Andreas Weninger, I think there are a lot of articles in, in the Austrian newspapers concerning those who are understanding Putin, that they are getting now the bill. So far I'm asking you to understand, we have to learn the lesson. You are closer to the problems, so far it's more urgent for you, without any doubt. Uh, but I think what we have to do uh, is to move here forward. And it is your right as Ukrainians also to ask your neighbors, to ask the other Europeans to support you, without any doubt. I'm asking you to do it urgent, friendly but straight, <laughs> directly, uh, and to use the opportunities. But you have to speak about your country outside. Uh, I think otherwise it does not function. I saw the uh, watch, I was too long, beg your pardon, but I'm prepared for question and answer in any direction possible. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for being a little bit provocative, I would say. And uh, do we have questions already? Well, you have maybe a couple of minutes to prepare, and uh, maybe I will ask you. Uh, at the moment, there is um, a YES forum uh, in Kiev, uh, which is usually very well attended also by uh, European politicians, by a lot of Ukrainian business people. Um, uh, and uh, today President Poroshenko was just uh, having a speech there and he said that his plan for returning Crimea is not the military plan. That his plan is that Ukraine should live in a way that people in Crimea would like to go with Ukraine, that it's going to be their wish. Um, I don't know, it resonated for me a little bit with what you have been saying. Is this one of the options or uh, is this the most realistic option? What, 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 how would you comment that? Hopefully it's a realistic uh, option. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I think you have to understand Vladimir Putin was brought up by KGB uh, in the old Soviet system and I think uh, here uh, there is an old Russian policy, they what they have, they are not 
giving up. Eh? I think there were some mistakes in the past, but it makes no sense to discuss it because the situation is now the current one. Eh? Uh, maybe the Ukrainian government was concerning Sevastopol, not enough flexible. Eh? There's a certain mythology for the Russians on Crimea, but the Crimean War in the 19th century and so on and so on, that plays for sure uh, a certain role. Uh, I think if there's such a compromise, uh, it would be nice, but the more urgent question see from my side, but you are Ukrainian, not me, uh, is, I think, to consider uh, Donbass and, uh, and the eastern Ukrainian region to stabilize this. And for sure, this I have to say, to, and I was well impressed, uh, the Ukrainian identity. I may tell you, I was at the book fair uh, here in, in, in Lviv, and the speeches there, and I will give the message of the Austria, were very impressive. Because it was not speeches of hatred against the Russians, it was an invitation, I think, how can we settle the things and how can we move forward, uh, also concerning culture. Culture is a bridge, but not as a differentiation. I think, uh, keep this line, I would say. Stop. <laughs> United Europe now, because we all hear about Portugal, Spain, Greece, and other problems inside Europe. I think you have to differentiate. Uh, we have a, an internal problem uh, in Spain and Great Britain uh, concerning Scotland and uh, Catalonia, but this is not a crisis of the European Union. It is an internal problem of these states, huh? and obviously. <coughs> It's clearly shown, it might be also a lesson for you, that a certain kind of federalism, regionalization is necessary. I understand that it is difficult to do it in Ukraine now, because I think if you are doing it now, it will give the chance that the Russians are coming in and overtaking Luhansk, Donetsk, or so. But in general, I think you have to do this way. That's one part of the problem. The very interesting thing is, and it is especially a lesson for my beloved friends in London. The Scots want to be a part of the European Union. Mm -hmm. eh? I think which is, uh, by the London government, not so clear. Eh? <laughs> uh, I think here you have a battle. We want to be independent from the UK to be more European. I think here you can see uh, it's a contrary of the development. The second part you said, uh, these are the economic difficulties uh, in southern Europe, it is not only Portugal, Spain and Greece, it is also southern Italy. Uh, I think this is a symbol for a development behind. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why it is so, because I think I have an overview of what happened in Italy and Greece. I think they were not really using the funds in the right way. Uh, the funds of the European Union. I think hopefully there is an improvement. Uh, I'm a part of this exercise. We are trying now to do something on agriculture and to train the young generation, I think, to make investment and to improve in this. It might be really a chance. But this is a longer process, and I'm arriving also at the question of education, I've already mentioned. I think this has to be done there. And for sure, you can read it in the newspapers, uh, I think tax evasion in Greece uh, was a common sport in Greece, eh? not to pay tax. Eh? How can you avoid tax? Eh? Still, I may say. Recently I was in Athens going uh, to, to uh, the Braca. This is uh, the area where the restaurants are. If you are going to Acropolis uh, High, uh, to the monuments. Eh? I think the first question, as I was sitting down, uh, they are speaking all excellent English, partly German, say, do you need a bill? <laughs> Understood? Mm -hmm. huh? And I said, I need a bill for you in favor of Greece. Huh? Mm -hmm. Here you can see how the things are. That's a real problem in these countries. Huh? 
it is education that's true for Portugal and Spain. And in Spain, that's also a fault of the government. Uh, they had a strong belief, uh, construction is everything. And if you are traveling through Andalusia, that's the southern part of uh, Spain, uh, I think they built houses and houses and houses on every hill. Huh? It was a great business. The houses are all empty. I think if you have a little bit of money, go there and buy a house. It's so cheap. Huh? But they were crazy. They didn't stop it. And that ruined the banks. Huh? Now we have this problem of Pankia, that one of the great uh, Spanish banks, and so on and so on, because they cannot get back their money. Huh? So far, here yeah, are really mistakes. And here I'm in favor that the European Union should be stronger uh, by the advisory capacity to tell them, my friend, dear Greek government, dear Italian government, dear Spanish government, we are making mistakes. That's moving in this direction. <coughs> Concerning the banks, for example, the control system for the banks is uh, increasing. And that's quite okay. Because what the banks invented uh, on loans and funds and so on and so on was partly crazy. And here, that was the mistakes of the governments. That has to be quite straight and we need a public discussion about this. What we need in addition that was not your question. We need a European public. We don't have a European public. We have still a national public, uh, but about the European question, the European public is not existing. I don't know the Ukrainian TV, but maybe it's the same situation. In all the national TVs, we, uh, we have talk shows. Huh? Mm -hmm. Every the evening, three, four, five are sitting there, they are knowing everything, and speaking about everything. Uh, I think, I may tell you, knowing the, the uh, European TV systems, there is no European talk show. We have European skiing, we have European uh, sports, we have European bicycling, we have European and so on and so on, championships, all existing. No European talk show. Uh, I'm involved in, in one of these organizations and I was going to the European Broadcasting Union. These all the public broadcasters are here united. Why is there no talk show? And they said to me, you have to understand, if you are doing so, we have to divide the advertisement at this time. And nobody wants to divide the advertisement between the different companies. Huh? So far, I may tell you, we have really one European talk show, and it's a European song contest. <laughs> <laughs> because at the end, you have a voting. <laughs> and if you are looking there, you can look who is voting for whom. I think here you're getting a kind of a map who likes his neighbor and who does not like his neighbor. It's really interesting. It's not a voting for the song. Huh? Nothing against Conchita Wurst. <laughs> it is a voting of relations. And therefore, on the one side, by, uh, by the social network, uh, by the computer system, by internet, we have close relations but we have, have not enough exchange of information and discussion by all the technical possibilities we have today. Last row, somebody, a lady. Yes, please. Uh, Alexander, how much were you representing the center of the uh, University also and the international university? My question is more or less uh, related to the current conflict uh, in the eastern part of Ukraine. It is a challenge for Ukraine, it is also a challenge for you. What is your vision of the way out strategy? Because European partners are important for the security questions of Ukraine also, but nevertheless the attitude and the steps which are done, they are not stopping and they are not curing the current situation. So what, what, is, what is your vision of that? May I say, here I'm a little bit more opti optimistic than you, uh, what's happening there is understood as a European problem. It's not understood as a problem only for the Ukraine. Uh, I think if you're looking how the politicians are moving and so on and so on, uh, it is understood as a European problem. And I know and I've been a part of this, the system now of 28 members 
to move to sanctions, I think is, if you have 28 around the table, to get one opinion is extremely difficult. We have no European government. I think so far it's necessary that the 28, with the same vote each, have to decide. And I think, thanks to Vladimir Putin, we are getting decisions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sad to say so, uh, but this is a reality. For sure, including my own government, uh, a little bit reluctant, and we shall consider, and maybe we can talk. Uh, and the Austrian Chancellor is saying he will go to Kiev, to convince Kiev. What shall he do to convince Kiev on this subject? <laughs> he shall go to Moscow, that's the great list of uh, and he can convince Putin. I think sometimes, having been a politician and being still involved in politics, I wish uh, all my politi political friends a reality check. <laughs> this are some things really missing. They are living sometimes uh, in an illusionary world. And so far we have to be very outspoken. That's the reason why I said to the EU, Ukrainians have to raise a voice wherever you're coming, showing of this problem. I think, for sure, there will be some questions also to you raised, what you did wrong or right, and so on and so on. But this is better if the questions are, are really raised. What is the vision to come out? May I say the worst uh, solution will be that this eastern part will get a situation like Abkhazia, Ossetia, Transnistria, uh, nagorno karabakh and so on and so on. That's the strategy of Vladimir Putin. He's trying to open areas in different countries where he can uh, mm -hmm. close or open. Uh, I think quite sure to make the countries insecure. Yeah. That's, uh, I think, uh, the first bad version. The second version is that uh, here the criticism and the activities might become stronger by the Europeans. Uh, I'm sure that some of the sanctions, not all of the sanctions are very clever, but some of the sanctions uh, are giving uh, some possibilities, especially concerning banks and money uh, and the oligarchs. I think if I'm looking to all the oligarchs sitting in Austria and uh, providing their money and putting aside, including some uh, Ukrainian oligarchs, I have to say, uh, I think it plays a certain role. Uh, oligarchs are not uh, deciding Russian politics, but they have a certain influence. And I think we have to do this step by step, uh, not a crash and so One thing I'm quite saying quite clearly, don't expect that the European army will come and help you, because there is no European army existing. Uh, even the question to get weapons, I was asked by journalists today, is extremely difficult, because he asked me, will Austria send weapons? I said to them, no, because we are not producing weapons. Even if I'm looking to the Austrian army, they have not enough weapons <laughs> for the current existence, which is a mistake. We are getting a new challenge on security. Uh, that's, you might understand, I'm 73, that at the end of my life, uh, I have to look to security, even to military security, as a question is completely new for me, and is really shocking, because our dream was long-lasting peace. I think uh, I'm not able to look to Emmanuel Kant, immer wäre der Friede, eternal peace, uh, but the dream was there, and being at the Catholic University, I think it's not so strange to think of these categories. <laughs> May I add, why I mentioned Catholic University, there are one two phases. What we have to encourage is, the discussion about the position of values, including uh, religion. I think, as far as I'm looking to Europe, uh, looking to my own countries, we have 140 jihadists fighting in Syria and uh, uh, Iraq. 140. That's a shocking number. I met recently in a Vienna tram. Uh, where I was uh, going, approached me three boys, students. And they told me, I don't know why they did it, but I was happy is, is the wrong word, but uh, it was interesting for me. We converted to the Islam. Mm. I said, my friends, 
you are living in a traditional Catholic countries. The Austrians are not so Catholic, but uh, I think the cultural environment is the Catholic part. Huh? And they said, ah, the Islam is challenging me. They want something to do. They want activity. They have convictions, and so on and so on. I think for me, it was, as a Catholic, I mean, a Roman Catholic, I think there's a challenge. This we have to consider. And we have to consider also maybe the dialogue with these parts of the different religions uh, who are not very much looking so in aggressiveness and are not believing on crusaders and jihadists and, and so on and so on. That's an extremely important challenge. I think the churches, the religions are challenged. I'm not quite sure if they are really answering. Frage auf Deutsch stellen und dann kurz übersetzen. Also Sie haben gerade über, früher in, in Ihren Einführungen haben Sie über diese Politik von Sowjetunion, dass an der Grenze hat man sozusagen quasi Republiken geschafft, um dann neue Konflikte zu äh, entwickeln. Und so ähnliche Politik pflegt jetzt auch Wladimir Putin, ja, diese gefrorenen äh, Konflikte, Transnistrien, Kauka also Abkhazien und jetzt sehen wir in Ost Ostukraine und so weiter. Was können wir dagegen machen? Äh, wäre nicht irgendwelche Regionalisierung oder regionale Kooperation als eine Alternative für diese Politik äh, sein? Das ist einfach meine Idee, weil am Anfang, den europäischen sozusagen diesen äh, Unionsprozessen, hat man sehr viel über regionale Kooperation, über Europa von Regionen gesprochen. Jetzt höre ich fast kaum über diese Idee. Was, wie schätzen Sie das? Wie, was meinen Sie über diese? Ist das schon vorbei oder haben wir noch Chance, mit dieser Idee irgendwie weiterzugehen? Meine Frage war kurz, dass die Strategie der 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 Strategie на початку, коли Європа тільки об'єднувалася, ці нові країни йшли, дуже багато говорилося про регіональну співпрацю. Вишгородська група, інші там групи були створені. І говорилося про Європу регіонів. Тобто, дуже, чи не може бути стратегія такого регіонального акценту, як альтернатива до політики Путіна? Дякую дуже за питання, тому що це дуже важливо. Я думаю, що регіональна кооперація, я вибираю титул регіональна кооперація, це дуже важливо. And theoretically, the European Union has developed in the last one and a half year uh, the idea of macro regions. Uh, this is a cooperation uh, of, of bigger regions. Until now, uh, we were not very successful on this subject. I think my job, being in charge uh, of the stability pack for Southeast Europe, was to create something similar uh, in the Balkans. Uh, I failed until now. We have a regional cooperation council. What is the reason for? The real strange situation, I may tell you, uh, is the following. Uh, since the end of the First World War, uh, for example, uh, all the different parts of Yugoslavia were together in one state. Even before the First World War, a part of them were together either in the Habsburg monarchy or in the Ottoman Empire. I think these countries are now living out of a kind of hostility against each other and of differentiation. With crazy consequences. I give you some examples. It's an extremely battle between uh, the uh, Slovenes and Croats uh, about uh, the division of the Adriatic Sea in a day. Mm -hmm. uh, they are fighting for 100 meters for this, creating a kind of hostility. Uh, the Croatians and the Slovenians are building highways. Slovenia has one tendency, I think 20 kilometers before the highway is coming to the Croatian border, it's finishing and you have to go to a narrow road to the Croatian highway. I was asking the Slovenian government, why are you doing these silly things? We don't want that the people are going to Croatia. Uh, it's fighting for tourists. Huh? Uh, but I think it 
is a certain symbol of, of such a relation. I don't want to blame the Slovenes and the relations here. Uh, I think it is a general tendency to bring them together. That's even going in cultural affairs. Doing my job at the Balkans, uh, in a conference, we had three different boots for translation. Mm -hmm. One was entitled Srps, others Ratsky, Croat, and the third Bosniak. The languages are extremely similar. And I was always making the joke uh, to them in the coffee break. It was saying, now it's coffee break, but you need no translation at the coffee break <laughs> because they are understanding each other. It's really crazy. That's one of the obstacles uh, for more cooperation uh, of regional art. It's improving. And this is a learning process. And you know, being in a university, learning process is need a lot of time. <laughs> we are doing now the Danube Regional Initiative. I think the full title is European Union Strategy for the Danube Region. And these are 14 states, including Ukraine, uh, to come together along the river. May I say that Danube is a beautiful river, not only by landscape. It is the one river in the world. It's only the second longest in Europe. The one river in the world where in the whole basin, 14 states are together. 14. What? Four. Yeah? And we have to bring them together to cooperate. May I tell you the problems? The Danube is the border between Bulgaria and Romania for 470 kilometers. Until last year, we had only one bridge on 470 kilometers. Now we have a second bridge. For my lifetime, I was fighting for this bridge. What is now? We have the bridge, but we have no roads to the bridge. <laughs> they don't come, I'm optimistic, uh, and so on and so on. Here we see the difficulties. My beloved Romanian friends were always saying to me, ah, why shall we cooperate with the other side of the Danube? Here is still the Ottoman Empire. Huh? Uh -huh. It's Bulgaria, not the Ottoman Empire. Huh? I think we are amidst this learning process about neighborhood. I think my dear friend Commissioner Hahn will be now in charge of neighborhood. I wish him all the best. It, it is a tough job uh, to explain this. I'm, by the way, uh, sharing a center for democracy and reconciliation in Southeast Europe. We are doing now in different TV stations uh, a series, Vicinities. We are explaining one country via TV, the other country that they can see how the neighbor really is. Because what they all know, and we did even scientific research, pre-judges are existing. Long list. Knowledge, zero. Huh? Mm -hmm. Now we are trying to come down uh, with the pre-judges and to get the knowledge uh, higher up. So far, I think for sure, this direction of macro region, hopefully, regions hopefully is working. Uh, is going quick enough uh, in this direction. Also, we have to develop here the instruments. And again, I want to say the economic situation is pushing us together. I think uh, one of the big advantages, I may tell you the Austrian example, was the downfall of the Iron Curtain and our enterprises uh, got the message there's a bigger market, we can do business. And so far, if we are going to all these countries in the neighborhood, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Croatia, Serbia, uh, Slovenia, and so on, so we find a lot of Austrian enterprises. Uh, but not enterprises under Austrian leadership there, because people from, from the country are leading the enterprises. It's a very good development. Huh? I think the current situation has a little bit stopped this development. Even, I think, uh, we were withdrawing, for example, from, from Ukraine, which is a pity. Uh, I think we have still the Raiffeisen, which you might know, and also some construction business and so on and so on. But this is extremely important, uh, because the business is better than politics. <laughs> I think always the business is coming first. That's a positive side of the business. People want to make business. It's an important role of education you are doing here. The politics are always the the last coming on here. 
Uh, but you have to push the politicians, don't allow it. Mm -hmm. My name is Miroslav. Uh, you played a crucial role in Austrian politics in 1990s. You were a uh, vice chancellor. Uh, so my question is, have you ever met with Ukrainian presidents, Leonid Kravchuk or Kuchma, and what is your impression about Ukrainian politicians? Can you tell us some interesting That's stories? You can do it off record. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I think I know some foreign ministers of Ukraine. I think one was before ambassador. I have difficulties with name, but my age. Uh, was ambassador in Vienna. I think he had very good relations with his predecessor. I think you have uh, great changes. Uh, for sure, I met uh, Timoshenko. Uh, uh, here I was not so much impressed. I'm really quite open to you. Uh, I think I met uh, the first state president of Ukraine, Gorbachev, uh, but here I had the impression I'm meeting an old communist. What's your impression about Ukrainian politicians? <laughs> Maybe advice you would give them. <laughs> they are learning on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> what we have to do, I think to be quite open, we have to invite them more, not only for presentation and nice visits and the dinner and so on and so on. I think they have to be invited. I don't know if they are really coming uh, for international meetings, discussions, uh, dialogue for us and so on and so on, which are done not by politics, which are done by think tanks and so on and so on. This is uh, a process where politicians are learning a lot. I'm still in charge of such uh, activities and that's quite good because they have to learn not only to say, ah, the world is so and so and so, they have to answer questions and hearing other opinions and so on and so on. I think in a certain way, your politicians have to be internationalized. I met Yasin Yuk as he was president of the parliament, speaker of the parliament. He may met also. I have kind of follow-up question on the uh, role of uh, organizations. Uh, we can see that a lot of organizations that which were called to play crucial role in politics, like United Nations, the Security Council, mm -hmm. that they are not really doing their job. And now it turns out that uh, the think tanks, which you have just mentioned, that it looks like that they start to play some uh, you know, mediation role in the politics, though officially they are not in the politics. You know? so it, and this is kind of like the tendency. How do you foresee how, how can it, it develop, <laughs> this change? I think it is not the right development, but it is necessary. <laughs> yeah. So far we have to confront the international organizations that they are uh, using a lot of money and the results are zero. Uh, that has to be said quite straight. Uh, I'm doing in these uh, think tanks, I'm involved, I'm in the European Council for Foreign Relations, it is a Soros uh, invention, uh, and so on and so on. We are doing this quite straight. In the moment, uh, the representatives of international organizations are not coming because uh, they have the fear to be criticized. Uh, that there's one positive the side. Uh, they learn the lessons that they are not doing the right success stories. That's the first step. The second step uh, is what have you to change that they are really working. Do you think it's still possible to change this so, so huge uh, uh, bureaucratic are, machines? My dear, we are living in a global world and we need some international organization. Maybe uh, those who are organized different. Eh? My feeling is, for example, giving the European Council for Foreign Relations. We are inviting politicians to this, confronting them with the different opinions. I think that might be the next way. If it is successful, we will see. Thank you. Um, a representative of the European Business Association as well as the head of attorney at law company Arzinger. Um, what is your opinion from a geopolitical point of view regarding Crimea? What Ukraine has seen that from our standpoint of view, Crimea was annexed by, by the Russians, whereas we haven't really seen any patriotic movements inside the Crimea. So if you ask how many people have died so that the Crimea remains with Ukraine, 
or how many you know the screen soldiers or, or Russians have been killed, for example, assassinated by the Ukrainians, the number would be zero. So Crimea, unfortunately for Ukrainians, has have not been able to make a patriotic movement even now uh, when it's being annexed. Uh, the question is, what do you think, how should Ukraine behave? We are still considering Crimea as temporary occupied territory and um, in a way trying to say that, that we consider this being our own territory. Should we in, in long or short term um, say, okay, we accept that it is no longer our territory or should we continue fighting for it? Um, what is your, your view on this? I think for the current moment, as long as in Eastern Ukraine the situation is, you cannot move from Crimea. I think uh, it is defending the international law. I think that's a correct position. That's accepted nearly by everybody. Even if some friends of, of Russia are saying uh, that was uh, the wrong way. So far we cannot drop it. Maybe in the far future it is a bargaining subject. Do you believe there will be a, an effective legal remedy that, for example, there's a, a ruling uh, of any instance saying that you know, the Crimea's territory of Ukraine and Russia should give it up? Because so far, uh, international law has been proved to... For the moment, no. I think uh, what is the pressure on the Russians on this subject? It was a strange situation. That's, I, I didn't say it quite directly. Thank you very much for having the opportunity. I think we, European Union, United States, are really convinced that economic measures uh, are impressing in general the Russians. Partly it may be for the oligarchs and so on and so on, and uh, that some vegetables are not anymore existing in the Russia. But this kind of government which is in charge in Russia is not impressed by economic measures. I think, don't forget that the Russians uh, were going through centuries where they had really nothing. Okay, then they might have again nothing. Huh? And they survived by this. Uh, that's the difference. We are really convinced, ah, uh, the dividends are going down. It is really impressive for Russians. I think it's impressive for some oligarchs, but they have all their money outside. Huh? Uh, here we need a a reality check on this subject. I think uh, it is an instrument for the moment, but I think we need the mass of possibilities. I think the development of China might be in the future, not quite near, uh, will be an argument where Russia has to change the strategy. As far as I know, the eastern part of Russia Eastern Siberia and so on and so on. Ah. It's already changing. <laughs> you are right. Yeah, um, we'll the last the Ukrainian Catholic University. I was just going to ask you the following thing. You mentioned that uh, Ukrainian problem is not really seen as Ukrainian problem, but it's treated as European problem by, by, by Europe and Europeans. I'm just wondering to which extent do you think that Europe is uh, kind of caught by surprise? Mm -hmm. having this problem, or that was something kind of never been predicted, foreseen. I'm also been wondering to which extent you think this problem is seen as a problem by, by politicians, or what's what kind of general public opinion or kind of uh, simple average citizens who are also kind of seeing this problem as a problem. And then I'm also been wondering in which terms you would kind of briefly try to articulate this problem, or the other way of putting this question would be why this is a problem. If, uh, what, how did kind of Europe or kind of um, public mm. opinion would kind of describe what, what sort of problem is this problem? Because I mean, there are many probably different ways of kind of formulating this, uh, this problem. You said it was straight, uh, uh, a problem in a different way. Uh, I think uh, for some it is the historical memory. That's especially for my Polish friends. Mm -hmm. huh? uh, it is gaining, uh, creating a, f a feeling of insecurity. This is for the Baltic states. Mm -hmm. uh, with the Russian minority. Uh, that's a, a clear move uh, in this direction. I think the clear position of Angela Merkel, we are owing the fact that she is coming as Eastern Germany, <laughs> having some experience in a certain direction out of the past. Uh, that plays a very important role. In my generation in Austria, 
it is a memory out of the time where the Soviet, uh, where the Red Army was in Austria. Yeah. For the young generation, it's not anymore. But you have also a strange situation. I'm admiring uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban because there's a memory of 1956 in Budapest and around. And obviously, it's not a problem for him to make arrangements with Putin, atomic energy plant, and so on and so on. Here, see how different it is. In general, even bigger is, uh, and that was connected with the question of Crimea. Uh, it was a way of uh, putting, setting new realities by overtaking Crimea. Uh, that's understood in general as a danger uh, because international law is a minimal uh, mutual understanding of the rules. And I think here, by him, everybody is getting the feeling no rules existing. He wants to do what he wants, and that's it. Huh? Uh, this is a common feeling of a threat. Uh, for sure, because everybody is considering, okay, if Putin is doing so and there is no reaction, who will be the next? Yeah. Huh? And we have one tendency, and here I am really concerned, we are getting more politicians uh, having this autocratic behavior. Mm -hmm. If you want to drop the names, I will tell you. It's beside Putin, for example, Erdogan. Mm -hmm. It is uh, Orban. He made a remark, okay, Kabato Ukraine can be a part of Hungary again. Huh? That's agenda setting. And some friends of mine in Serbia, it's not my, my opinion, are saying that Vucic is looking in the same direction. We are getting, and this is a challenge for democracies, uh, I think we are getting here a new image of efficient politicians. Huh? Where is the limit of efficiency? Yeah? For sure, we are always asking politics must have results. Putin has results. But it has nothing to do with democracy. The yes. last question. My question is um, uh, with some kind of reflection of the session uh, of international law in Albach, uh, where was Ukrainian Crimean question raised. I'm just wondering uh, how can you estimate the Russian lobby in, in German speaking country like Austria and Germany? Because when uh, I had the chance to hear professors of law from Germany and Austria officially referred to the Crimea referendum data and some kind of sociology, and it was quite strange for me that educated people and scientists. Uh, easily uh, re refer to unofficial information? Uh, I think you have a number, and I've already mentioned it, of those who put in first day, uh, those who are understanding Putin uh, here. There are also some professors, but uh, I think we had in Austria one professor, Mangot, at the University of Innsbruck. I think he changed the attitude and was saying uh, international law was uh, mistreated uh, by Putin, uh, there are some changes in this direction. Uh, on the business side, you have to understand it by business. Because, uh, to say it quite clear, Mr. Schroeder is bought by Putin through his job concerning the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, we have a former Chancellor, Kusenbauer, he is bought uh, here by Oleg Deribaska, uh, and so on and so on. That's clearly written in the public, uh, and I think the importance of these guys is going down, for sure. Huh? Uh, that's mainly done with business and so on and so on. We have one problem, uh, a car company, which is a Canadian company by the way, but strong in Austria, it's Magna. Uh, also, uh, I think here are some discussions in this direction. Eh? Uh, this is a development. Uh, you have to know that the, the public judgment uh, is learning step by step. I think the positions which are existing now are different from those some months ago uh, because uh, it's coming out clearer and clearer. Eh? Closer and closer. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. With pleasure.